thanks for coming. Um, today we'd like to talk about how you grow a company from, from the very beginning to like, millions of users worldwide without going crazy. Because um, I've been through this journey and it's a wild ride, it's, it's a fun ride, but it's also, it can get pretty crazy, so it can break you down. So uh, what I'd like to talk is about the, the highs and the lows of this. Uh, and I want to make it useful, so I think this presentation doesn't really allow for questions. Uh, so at the end, I included my contact information, so I'd like to make it useful for everybody here. Um, can I get a show of hands of how many people are actually working on a, on a company of their own or like planning to, to start one? Like, can you just like, raise your hand? Okay, so like, there's a fair number of people. Um, so for, for, for all of you here, I want to make it useful, uh, so ask me questions over email. Uh, so. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a software developer. I was, I'm a Ukrainian-born software developer. I live in Canada. And uh, I started coding pretty early on. Uh, I got my first computer. It was a, an old Sinclair machine. For those of you old enough to remember what it looks like, it's like a pretty basic computer. Um, and I used it for playing games initially. Uh, but then I discovered it had computer language on it. It was basic, so uh, I taught myself that, and I was blown away by like, what the computer could do. For me, it was an unlimited toy of a sort. Um, so I just kept playing f with it for fun. Um, at about 15 or so, I discovered internet, and I was just blown away again. So I thought, this is what I'm going to do for life. Um, and since then, I was kind of doing that. Um, I got interested in web design, taught myself web development. Um, a bit later, started working with sort of some clients. I had no idea how to run a business of some sort. Um, but um, then I went to university and got formal education in computer science. Um, and also, in the second year, I started working on, on a company of my own. Um, for some reason, I never fit in into this corporate culture. I never thought of, like, I want to go and work at a corporation, at a, at a bank of some sort. Most of my peers at university wanted to go and work at some bank. For me, it sounded like just a career dead end. I would be like so unhappy doing that. For, and you know, nobody understood what I was talking about. Like everybody thought I was a bit nuts. Um, so I joke, only like half joke, uh, maybe about this, but uh, I was sort of unemployable. So for me, to like make a living, I couldn't find a company that I would fit in. Uh, so for me to make some money, I had to like invent my own company. So this is what I did. Um, and uh, 500 pixels is the third business that I've built, uh, the biggest and probably the most successful to date. Um, you know, the company itself started as a business we started about six years ago. Started as a hobby project before that. Um, we, we've had millions of people, I think a year about 100 million people actually visit and use the site. We have about 20 million active users any given month. Um, so uh, let's talk about how we started it. We began uh, with a friend of mine who I met at university. Um, and uh, we started different programs. He went into business, I was in computer science. Uh, we both were interested in photography. Our lives kind of ran in parallel. Um, he just started taking photographs, he was an amateur. Uh, my girlfriend at the time was a photographer and I saw her struggle uh, starting a business because photography schools at that time really, I, I guess now it as well, uh, really didn't talk about I mean, they taught you things about you know, taking photos and, and all the artistic uh, sides of photography, but then they, never, they were actually hush-hush and never told you anything about how you're actually gonna survive doing that. Um, which I thought was a big hypocrisy that you know, the schools should really teach you like, how, how you're gonna leave the school and make money with it. Like, because most people had no idea. Out of the class of usually 50 or so people every year would t take the class, and two or three of them would, have, would be photographers uh, Later on, but most of them would not be. And you know, one of the one of the stories is, you know, we met one of the classmates from from the photography uh, class, and she was a waitress at a restaurant. So I thought it was really sad, and we had to do something about it. Um, so uh, this is what we started the company, and you know, it began as a hobby project uh, in Live Journal, which was just a community. Um, and then I got together with Yvonne. We were traveling, uh, so we were living in different places. Uh, not in, not in Toronto, not in Canada at that time. And we started working remotely. Uh, and for about a year, uh, we tried making it work and it didn't really work for us. So at some point we decided to come back uh, to Toronto and physically get together and start working on it. That was late uh, 2007. Uh, so for about a year we were doing this. So around beginning of 2009, 
uh, we were back and started building. Um, so uh, this was the first iteration of the, of the blogging platform uh, that was built on LiveJournal. And we acquired some early audience, some followers um, on that platform who was, who was a really, it was, it was a small audience, but it was really engaged, really tight. And they really like what we were doing. So uh, I thought that was great. Um, and uh, it gave us an initial start. Uh, we bootstrapped the company, meaning we, we put our own time and money into it. Um, and we had a complementary skill set, which allowed us really to, to not engage other people to, to help us build this. Um, so being a software developer, um, I could pretty much build, and I was exposed to a number of uh, technologies from before, and I, I had experience working with, with multiple other platforms in this space, you know, ranging from gaming to, to social networking to video processing to e-commerce. So I had some experience uh, working with pretty large scale systems, so I kind of knew what needed to be done. Um, so I was able to build it, I was able to teach him uh, web design pretty quickly and, and uh, front end, work, front -end uh, design that had to be done. Um, so it worked out nicely. Um, we almost ran out of money at some point, but that was, that was us actually launching the site. This is, this is my apartment. We launched it on Halloween of 2009, and this is how we did it. Um, so um, some, of the, some of the things that we learned really early on was that you don't really need a big team. And now it's probably like a common knowledge of a sort. Uh, but back then, it wasn't really obvious. Uh, you know, most of the tools didn't exist. Like the word startup didn't, I didn't even know that. Like there wasn't a thing called startup. Like it would just, you know, go and start a business. It was super risky, like ten, nine out of 10 companies would fail. And we knew all that. There was no infrastructure, no support. Like nobody uh, understood what we were doing. Uh, Flickr was the biggest competitor. And it was a big established company sold to Yahoo, like, you know, five years ago. Um, so nobody really got it, but we, were, we knew we were onto something interesting because our users liked it. Um, so we just kept building for this small audience, right? We launched um, with this early audience from LiveJournal. We had about maybe 2,000 email addresses uh, from LiveJournal, and this is what we launched with. Um, and it seemed to work really well. Um, so, you know, one of the lessons I'd say is have, uh, rather than have a lot of, having a lot of people that merely like what you're doing, have a small but really engaged audience that loves what you're doing, is willing to give you feedback, is willing to like, live your product and help you develop it. Um, this is probably like the 1% of the early innovators uh, that will adopt your technology just for the sake of it being like, new and cool. Um, so that is, I think, for early stage companies, really, really important, especially in the consumer space. And um, you know, back then, there weren't too many platforms that you could hook onto. To develop your audience right now, you, you know, there's so many social platforms that you can tap into and grow on the back of. Um, it's a really good strategy. Um, another one is artificial scarcity. So uh, I was really inspired by the way Gmail was launched. If you remember, in 2004, Google launched Gmail, and you know, you couldn't get in. Like you had to sign up for the invite and then wait for. Like I waited a year for my Gmail to like to sign up for it, and you know, I was I was at the point where like fuck it, like I'm not going to care. Um, but, but then I loved it, right? and, and so many people, like, I don't know, like maybe a third or something like that of all email addresses online or Gmail, with Google Apps is probably even more. Um, so artificial scarcity works. Um, basically, you, you promise people something really great, but you limit access to it. Um, we didn't really do it consciously. We did it so, so that we don't expect, uh, expose people to the bugs that we had in the system, so we had to limit access to like, fix all the problems. Um, but an interesting dynamic happened. People started trading our invite codes for like some other invite codes and started selling them on eBay, and that generated interest. So gradually we allowed people in, and uh, probably by the end of the year, so in a couple of months, we had maybe 5,000 users uh, that signed up on the platform, contri started contributing photos. So it started growing, but really slowly. Um, one of the other things I think is important is you know your limited resources allow you for uh, greater focus, you cannot do everything. So you don't have enough money, you don't have enough time, you don't have enough people, like, you have to limit yourself. This forces you to focus on the most important stuff, and that is deli delivering the great user experience uh, for your core audience. So I think it's actually a good thing when you don't have enough money and you don't have enough time and you don't have enough people. You know, you, you build the most important stuff. And you know, 
if you're familiar with lean startup uh, methodology, they talk about uh, minimal viable product. You know, at some point we, we thought, you know, the minimum viable is just not enough. For you to, to make a difference, for you to be noticed, you have to be, I mean, you cannot build everything, but <laughs> Evgeny at some point introduced this notion of the minimum delightful product. So like, what is the minimal set of features that you can build to make your users go, wow? Like, what is it, you know, go, and you figure it out, you build that. Um, so this is what we did. Okay, some of the, some of the weirdness that we encountered early on, um, again, based on the, on the fact that we didn't have enough resource and we didn't have enough money and time, um, like one of the things that we did is we hosted the site on a Mac Mini that you know, one of my friends put uh, into a data center. And I think until about a million users a month, we hosted it on that. All the photographs were attached on this um, USB drive. Uh, at some point, the USB connection actually became the bottleneck for photo del delivery. So it became slow and we moved it to Amazon. And you know, at some point, the mini you know, just like, collapsed and couldn't handle the stuff anymore. Um, Evgeny <laughs> was running out of money. He, uh, he thought, OK, like, what could I do to, to make a living in the meantime? And so he went, and, went into like, movie background shooting. Um, and you know, for, for those of you like, that, that don't really know this industry, there's a lot of downtime. When you shoot a movie and you know, like, the people moving in the background, is, like, this is what he was doing. Um, sometimes it could be waiting for like eight hours for some you know, prominent scenes to be shot. And then, then the background comes in. And maybe this day you cannot even like, shoot it. So he had a lot of downtime. He was actually working or reading uh, on the sets um, doing that. Um, Co-working spaces didn't really exist at that time also, so I think there wasn't like a single one in Toronto that. Uh, so we worked out of Starbucks, mostly. I think we've, uh, I think we know like all the pretty good locations for, uh, for faster internet and not too many people in cafe, uh, coffee shops. Uh, almost ran out of money. I was, I was down to like $300, I think, on my bank account and you know, my rent was like $1,500. A month, so for a couple of months, like I was, I was no idea how I was going to make it, but somehow we did. Um, and um, we pretty much didn't do any marketing. Uh, we acquired about thirty thousand users in that in that year that followed, um, because we didn't really know anything about it. I mean, I read some Seth Godin books and I really liked them, um, but we were not marketers, so we kind of tried to build marketing into the product, and it worked. Uh, socially, it uh, it was spreading pretty well. Uh, but it was still early to say you know, whether or not we were onto something. We were working on several projects at the time. Um, and at some point, it became apparent that this one is, is actually taking off, so we shut down everything else and focused on this. But for some time, we were really not sure. Um, so um, you know, given that the growth continued and we didn't have enough money to support ourselves, we thought you know, maybe you know, the interesting thing to do is to to start offering our community some services. And we did launch that early on. But development was slow. And we decided to, t to raise some uh, VC funding, which sucks. Like, for you to, to raise money, raising money is hard, like, wherever you are. And you know, even at any stage, it's difficult. Um, at that stage in Canada, at that time, it was impossible. Well, not impossible, but like, extremely difficult. Like, most people didn't understand what we were doing. There's a, there's a conference of a sort. It's called Demo Camp. And it's organized, actually, it was organized by the early startup community in Toronto. We couldn't even get in. Like, they would ignore our pitches. Um, so, uh, so did VCs. Uh, we've tried raising money in Canada, and it didn't work. Um, and then somehow we discovered AngelList. That was really early at that time. So the founders of AngelList actually helped us perfect our pitch and introduce some investors. I think they were doing a lot of community curation early on uh, by hand as well. So actually, Nivea and Naval. Uh, we're really, well, they really liked the company and they really actively helped us. Um, so eventually we came to find some really great uh, New York based VCs and they believed in, you know, all the conversations I had in Canada, they were like, I don't know like, if this is a thing. Um, and one of, the, one of the really early investors in the company, when I had the first call, she said, I get it, I want it. And then uh, you know, the next conversation was like, oh, I want to put 50,000 in it. But I don't want to be too pushy, but like, if there's room, I can put more. And so on and so on. So I really like the difference. I'm like, OK, so these Americans get it. Like, I, want, I want to work with these people. Um, so it was good. Um, Angel has now grown. Um, it's a really good resource. So if you're not on it, you should be on it. I think 
you know, if, if you're at the stage where you have a product and, and you've launched it and uh, you have some early traction, like maybe you have like 10 users that signed up on it, put, it, put your uh, presentation, put, put a profile on AngelList, put your presentation on it. Um, it's a great resource. So with that, um, with that early go growth also came early pains. Like none of us were managers and uh, like we had no idea how to manage people. We, I've, I mean, I've hired people in the past but not at that scale, not with that kind of responsibility. At that time, we didn't really have any sort of former roles. I wasn't CEO. Like, we didn't even have any sort of designations. Um, um, but, you know, aside from, like, managing the team and hiring the people that we couldn't like, onboard fast enough, we had, like, crashing systems, and, uh, and our office space was too small, and, you know, at some point, our CTO left. He was an early partner, and uh, at some point, he decided to to leave and start his own company. And he actually went to YC and uh, um, started a company there and so on. But at that time, it was really bad. Was, he left like two days before we signed our C deal. And you know, one of the VCs called me and she's like, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years. This never happens. Like, what's up? Um, but we've convinced everybody that everything's fine. Um, so it was stressful, but it was fun. Uh, the team was small and it was really, really co cohesive. Um, so uh, we had lots of fun, um, and you know as the fires continued, um, and we gained some momentum, we got some press. People kept telling me, uh, "Oh, it's a good problem to have." I'm like, "Fuck you! You have no idea what this is. Like, this is an awful problem. I don't have a solution for it." Um, one of my lawyers was actually repeating this all the time. He's like, "Oh, it's a good problem." I'm like, Glenn, you suck. Um, so, uh, but somehow we managed through it. Moved into a new office. Um, one of the things that we did uh, following this, uh, and that was in late 2011, is we launched a public API. And I looked at it as a marketing, marketing and growth engine, uh, which worked really well. I don't think we were prepared for it. Our traffic doubled like in three days or something like this. Um, but if your company, especially in the consumer space, if, if it is a platform that can use or can utilize the, uh, the public API, do it, because that will allow you to build an ecosystem. And once you do that, and once you're successful building an ecosystem, uh, you win. So um, I really like what Facebook did with their Open Graph API, and I like their growth, and we've been to uh, a couple of their events that they put together by then, some of the hackathons, and I thought this is what we should be doing. Uh, their developer evangelists were really good, um, so I thought this is a cool thing uh, to do to grow the platform. Um, and I think now we, we have a lot more users. I think about like 12 to 15 million users every month would actually uh, come through the, through the third party services built with the API by us and not by us as well, mostly outside developers. We have like several thousands of developers building on the platform. Uh, we moved into a new office. We, we started building mobile applications. Um, and when we launched our first mobile app, we decided to do it on iPad iPad was really early. We thought uh, our thesis and, and um, our imagery and just, just the notion of what we are would look really good on our iPad. Uh, and then when we launched, uh, the adoption was, was really fast and really successful. I think in a week we signed up like 100,000 users, which might be not a lot now, but then it was pretty fast growing. Um, and this, again, speaks to the early audience. When you have that, when you launch a new product, you can really offer them um, that and, and that becomes, those, those people become your evangelists of a sort. If you remember Pebble that recently launched their second watch, you know, they s explicitly offered it on Kickstarter explicitly to the previous uh, customers, uh, which was really good. So we did sort of similar uh, thing with the iPad app. It worked really well. We continued pushing on mobile, uh, launch on Android, launch on iPhone later on, you know, uh, acquired some companies as well, um, which caused some problems, you know, I think. The next, uh, oh, so, you know, speaking of problems, um, people talk about, like, the good problems they have and the bad ones. This is an example of a bad problem. Like, when you grow too fast, um, things start falling through the cracks. If you don't pay attention to some of the stuff, um, you know, the company grows beyond your control. So, I think, I think the saying is, you know, your complexity of the company is limited by the 
by the most complex person in it, and I was trying to control the, the company, and I was like, I was limiting the company by my own complexity. I couldn't handle all this. This happened. So, you know, one day I wake up, and uh, and apparently Apple took down our uh, iPhone app from the App Store, and we don't really know why. We contacted them, and they said, oh, okay, there's some nudity on the platform. We suspect pornography. And uh, what Yevgeny does is sends out a tweet saying, like, oh, Apple blocked us. Like, why? You know, all of a sudden TechCrunch picks it up. He talks to them. I come back to the office. I like I usually work. I started working pretty late, like 10 or 11 o'clock. Um, and I come back to the office, and there's a shit storm brewing. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so we're trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, he's having some conversations with TechCrunch and some other press. And I, I'm trying to manage it, uh, but it kind of goes out of hand. We, we think, okay, like let's let's stop all the communication. Let's figure out. Like I call the uh, the PR consultant uh, that we had, and uh, he said, okay, I'll come come in tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow I wake up and we're like all over the news. We're like on CNN and NBC and CBC and like everywhere. Um, and uh, because of the reporters, they they like a good story, like and they like a juicy story. So uh, you know, pornography in, in North America is such a juicy story, like. And, and they put porn and Apple in the, same, uh, in the same sentence. All of a sudden, it's like a cool thing to do. Uh, and I'm like, shit, like everybody shut up, right? So like, I gathered the war room um, in one of the boardrooms, and I'm like, look, like, you do this, you do this. I just like short and simple commands. I'm just almost yelling at the company, um, at, at my core team. And uh, you know, because of that, we, we solved the crisis. And we actually we made pretty good contacts with Apple VPs, so a couple of really high profile people at Apple, which was great. Um, and we finally resolved the crisis and you know, got the app restored and actually got some good publicity. We had a spike in user signups and all that. Um, but because of this, uh, my CTO quit again. Like, this is the next guy. You know, and, I, and I went through like three CTOs by then. I'm like, shit, I can't work. And, and, and by the way, I had to dismantle all the team that he's built. So all of a sudden, we go from 30 people down to like 17 people and I lose all the developers that they brought in. Uh, and I realized, hey, look, the company, the company's culture is diverging. Like it goes to different streams. Like it's not really, like that's not the company I want to build, right? But it goes some other direction. Um, I think I realized the importance of company culture too late. Um, anyway, let's go on. Um, so, um, you know, some of the things here, good and bad. We scale by s scaling too fast. We accumulated some of the management debt. So that's why I didn't. We didn't have time to put enough. A proper procedures in place. I was starting to lose people. We also did some cool stuff with, you know, some of the partnerships with big, big companies. But, you know, when you when you try to do too much, you lose that core focus. So, um, and uh, that's not a good thing. I mean, we were we we're trying to go all, after all the cool partnerships and all this, and you know, Google and Microsoft and all that was great, uh, but it really didn't move the uh, the needle that much. It didn't propel the company forward so much. Um, so looking back, it was kind of a waste of time. But we made some great contacts out of that. Um, you know, eventually, I had to raise some more money. And uh, again, it was a shitty process. Uh, but I pulled it through. <laughs> and uh, we, got, we got some money from, from some really good people in this round. One of them, the Andreessen Horowitz was leading the round. Uh, I really recommend them. If you, if you can raise money from them, you're in a good position. It's some of the smartest money you can get in the valley or anywhere in the world, probably. Um, oh. So, um, you know, we were growing too fast. I think so. Looking back, we were, uh, we were growing too fast and especially um, failing to repay that management debt that we've created, not having enough uh, and proper procedures in place, not hiring people properly. Um, not building the product dil diligently, we had to, you know, shut down a number of initiatives, um, and that affected morale. That affected uh, a lot of things in the company, down to the point where, like, I was no longer there. So at some point, I had problems with board members and some of the, my some of my executive teams, and at the point, at that point, I was pretty exhausted. So that doesn't allow you when you get yourself into that position, you get you start missing things. You're, you're too tired to pay attention to everything that's going on. So you're really becoming effective. Do not put yourself in that position. You will not like it. I didn't. Um, so at some point, I was pushed away from the company. I, I left as a CEO. Uh, and then six months after that, I left the company entirely. 
And uh, it wasn't a good breakup. Um, so I was kind of left in, in this limbo state. I was, I was neither here nor there. It was a transition point to which I thought I was, I was really sad. I was really upset. Um, I was angry and couldn't do anything. So uh, I think I'm about to wrap up. Thanks for the notice. Um, that's a shitty place to be. Like, if you ever end up in this, um, take a break. And uh, this is what I did. And I thought, you know, I can't really affect any change, so I just, like, I'm just going to go somewhere. So I went to, uh, I went to a place where I like, surfed for four months, uh, which wasn't bad, but um, it also allowed me to decompress and you know, get it out of my system. But you, know, you do that for a little bit, and then being a founder, like, you cannot get away from, from yourself. Um, so all of a sudden, you become itchy, and you're like, oh, look, I'm, I'm not really being productive with my life. I need to do something else. Um, I need to be useful. I need to, like, I'm just wasting my time. Um, so recently, I started working on a new project. And uh, hopefully, you'll hear about it soon enough. Uh, I think that's about it. So, you know, I would like to end it with this. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. I'd like to be useful. This is my email. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me if I can help you with any of these things. Like, this is what I'm good at, but maybe some other things. If you have any questions, please feel free. Thanks a lot. That's it.